Yes. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to From Borderlands to Bathhouses, a live reading and conversation with Jesus Ivaez and Ricardo Bracho. Before we begin, I want to thank Kelly Writers House for hosting this event. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that the University of Pennsylvania stands on the indigenous territory known as Lenape Hoking, the homelands of the Lenape, also known as the Leni Lenape. We also recognize that the university is responsible for the displacement and gentrification of Philadelphia's Black Bottom neighborhood, a process that continues to impact Black Philadelphians today. As we launch into a conversation on borders um, and their accomp accompanying technologies of violence, I encourage us to think through the overlapping histories of displacement that facilitate our ability to gather here today. Um, today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing actor, playwright, educator, and poet, Jesus Ayvayas. Jesus is from El Paso, Ciudad Juarez, um, places that inspire much of their creative and intellectual work. They hold a BA from the University of Texas, El Paso in communications, as well as an MA in communications from Cal State Long Beach. They are currently finishing their MFA in playwriting at Brown University, where they recently presented their thesis show called Spread. The show is in part a thank you to all of the students that they have taught in their 8.5 years as an educator in Austin, Texas, a meditation on boyhood, and, practice, and a practice of forgiving themselves for leaving the classroom. As someone who has seen how deeply meaningful Jesus' relationship is to, um, to their students, I wanted to take a moment to congratulate them on completing their thesis show before we move on. <laughs> Um, and it would also be remiss of me not to mention that this week, Jesus was also awarded the Yale Drama Series Prize for Bathhouse PPTX. Let's go. <laughs> a hauntingly brilliant, brilliant play about bathhouses, the ghosts that reside in them, and the technologies for queer survival that they engender. It was this play that actually inspired the title for the event today um, and some of the questions that accompany it. Accompany it. How might the porosity, and flu flu the porosity and fluid textures of the bathhouse inspire a reconceptualization of borders? What technologies of resistance might become possible when we thieve ourselves from the state? Um, so these are some of the questions that came to mind as I send the invitation for Jesus to be here today, and hopefully you know, we'll be a part of the conversation that Jesus and Ricardo engage in um, later on. So the readings and conversation will be facilitated by Ricardo Bracho to my right, um, the feminist, queer, and transgender uh, um, center and G uh, gender sexuality, no, gender sexuality and women's studies uh, department um, or program, um, artists in residence here at Penn. The readings and conversation will be followed by a brief Q&A with the audience. Um, lunch will be served briefly after the event, so around 1 p.m. And masks are required for the event, so if you don't have a mask, please find them in the back right corner of the room. So without further ado, I will pass it on to Ricardo and Jesus. Hi, thank you all for uh, yeah for for uh, welcoming in me into the space. Um, thank you so much for all of your organizing efforts and and um, yeah and the, just the tremendous amount of 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 love that I think um, is gifted to the artist when when folks organize events like this um, uh, because I think sometimes as artists it's it's really easy to become um, object uh, and and so I. It, it always feels great whenever, um, yeah, t to be received um, with a kind of deep love that I think uh, it takes to to craft an event um, deliberately and and with intent and and with a tremendous amount of care. So thank you so much, Joshua. Um, I want to start today with uh, a reading of uh, a scene from Bathhouse PowerPoint. Um, so. The play, uh, to give you a bit of context, and, and throughout uh, today's, our time together, um, I'll be sort of contextualizing each of the scenes that we're reading. Uh, we're reading from four different plays. Um, at the top of every different excerpt, I'll be contextualizing or talking about the play it comes from, where in the play we are, and then we'll just sort of go. Um, this is, again, from bathhouse.powerpoint. The play is shaped like a 10th graders presentation on the history of cleanliness and showers and then devolves into uh, becoming a presentation about bathhouses. Um, 
the school that this presentation is happening at used to be a bathhouse. This is largely inspired. This is like me deeply just like being a thief of reality. Um, the Midtown Spa, which is the bathhouse that was in Austin, uh, eventually closed down and got turned into a middle and high school. Um, <laughs> So it's really wild to think about, like, oh, these kids are, like, having lunch where, like, we used to do poppers. So um, so uh, we'll begin with the presenter and then move into Carlos and Chela, who are these sort of ghosts uh, from, from, from this school's previous life as a bathhouse. Uh... Uh, uh, we are now in the milieu of last, 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 last week, uh, the bathhouse. Now, uh, uh, people may not know what a bathhouse is, and it makes sense. Uh, they'll be forgotten. Uh, many shut down in 1984. Less than 70 were left in the United States by 2014. Less than 37 remained open by 2023. Years later, today, uh, after so many um, uh, political shifts, <laughs> none, the corpses of these places gutted for parking lots, for Paneras, debtor prisons, even schools. This one, for example, here. Yes, uh, the Academy of Innovation and Thought, go Einsteins, uh, our soon to be alma mater was to one such a place. This school was indeed once a bathhouse. The architecture still remains quite similar. In fact, the bones still lingering beneath our feet, some pulsing muscle of it in our walls. Uh, another fun fact, uh, the custodial closet remains almost entirely intact, and the clock up there, uh, to the scars of the building's previous life, its previous name. The Uptown Spa, uh, or as it was once lovingly known, that shithole near North Hollywood Metro Station, not far from the Cobra or the Bullet, all places now closed. These places, always somewhere entirely in plain view, somewhere hidden, Always someone is coming inside, someone is leaving. Always steam baths, dry saunas, showers, water, bleach, wood, oil. Here, through this door, a sling, a hallway of mirrors, a maze, a hailstorm of hands, a sliver of light. Don't you want it? Don't you want a glory hole, a cage, a cot, a St. Andrew's cross, a gym nobody is using, a sad vending machine, and someone next to it is aging and wants... Always these plays is aging, ending. Uh, so in the spirit of uh, less tell and more show, uh, today we'll pretend that every place is always everywhere, that architectures are always haunting each other across times and geographies. Today, let's imagine that this place is what it once was, this place for beginnings and ends. Don't worry, uh, nobody will die in the next slide. Nothing will end. Uh, this slide is about cleanliness, so uh, I'm still on topic. Slide. A shitty club mix of Crystal Waters down Destination Unknown is playing in the grotto. At the very bottom floor of the bathhouse where the sling and the cage are. A maze of private rooms, too. Gold foil numbers stuck on each. Chella enters the hallway. She's in her North Hollywood spa uniform polo, carrying her cleaning cart, headphones, in room thir 32. She opens the door. Small smoke clouds drift out. Oh, there's someone there. Oh, I'm sorry. You're not... Are you doing drugs? No. No. You look like you're on drugs. It's just hot in here. Your eyes look crazy. No, they don't. Yes, they do. That's too big. What's wrong with your mouth? Nothing. Okay, well, you're not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to clean this room right now. I don't know where to go. Go home. I came here with my friends. Go home with them. I don't know where they are. You want me to call them? We can page them if... Gloria what? Stefans, get on your feet, starts playing Interrupting Crystal Waters. God, what an awful mix. If you want me to, it happens a lot. People get lost here a lot. They probably left without me. They, they weren't my friends. Why'd you come with them then? Well, I didn't come with them. I, I came by myself. I just met them here. They, they said they wanted to fuck me. Both of them? Yeah, they're married. Oh. And they're okay with that? With being married? With having relations with you in front of each other. Oh, no. They were going to go at the same time. Go? They were going to fuck me at the same time. They were going to DP me. Viene putisima, purisima. Both peepees in your butt? Yeah. Well, that's a lot. I get tired even looking at one. Do you think I can just stay here? No, you gotta go. I'm gonna get in trouble because you didn't pay for extra time. I don't have any money. You can't stay here. My phone's dead. Charge it. I don't have a charger. I can lend you mine. I don't actually have a phone. I lost my stuff. Ay, Dios, muchacho pendejo. Okay, well, you good? What? What are you chewing? My cheek. Don't do that. You're gonna bleed. I'm already bleeding. Oh, do you want mouthwash? Uh, no. Uh, no, I, I'm bleeding from my... Uh, in, oh, no, in no, 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 no. 
Do you need, you want to borrow my phone to call your friends? I told you I just met them. I don't know their number. I, <gasps> Who are you yelling at, cabron? I'm sorry. I'm just, uh, can you, uh, do you think maybe I, 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 I can get a ride home with you? Absolutely not. Please. Where do you live? To your home? Fuck no. Will you think about it? I won't. I don't know where I live right now. I would be safer in a house with someone who knows where they live. Ay, chavalo. You're so dumb. God, you're so young to be this sad and this dumb. If you don't take me home, I'm going to stay here. They're going to call the cops if you stay here. Who is? The manager. Then help me. No. Just tonight, please. I I just need somewhere to be. If you, if you had a kid, if I was your kid, how would you feel if... I don't got kids. Okay, but if you did? I did, and I didn't want no kids, so I don't got no kids. I got to clean this room. Get up. I can help. I'll, I'll, I'll clean this room. Since, since I made it dirty, I, I can clean this room. Look, I'll clean it. I'm cleaning it now. Ay, Dios, fine, fine. Okay, I will give you a ride home. Not mine, another home. You can pick. Anywhere between here, Canoga Park, or Van Nuys, or Reseda, or Woodland Hills, or Chatsworth, you would probably like Chatsworth. <sighs> Thank you so much. Thank you. You're a lifesaver. I'm going to go shower. Uh, and then I can meet you after your shift uh, ends. Nah, baby. You can't get something for nothing, you know? But I, I don't have... You're going to help me. You got it? Between now and then, you're going to help me clean. We're going upstairs to get some clothes. I have an extra shirt. It's going to be big and a hat for you. Don't talk to nobody and you can't do no sex things again. You can't make more mess, okay? Okay, I'll try. No, you can't make more mess. And if you do, I'm going to hit you. I got a broom and I can punch really hard and I never lost a fight ever in my life. Not even when I fought my cousin, that fucking puta. So you better do what I'm telling you. What's your name? Carlos. Okay, you're Charlie now, okay? Won't people know I don't work here? Pendejo, nobody cares if anybody works here. They just want more towels and lube, barely. If anybody asks, just, just tell them, I don't fucking know. You're an intern. Just no more dicks or butts or nothing. You got it, Charlie? Let's go. And grab your shitty sheets, cochino. I'm Chela, okay? Chela, come on. And they wheel the cleaning cart out. So, uh, so Carlos and Chela exit, okay? Uh, thank you for showing. Great work. Uh, and Chela, that's the woman you saw cleaning, hates gloves at home. And Carlos, that's the person that Chela found in here. They hate condoms here. And Chela thinks, how will you know your dishes are clean, clean if you wear gloves? How will you know you've killed the germs if your hands are gloved? But here she wears yellow gloves, pushing the little yellow cart to clean. The wheels sound like something dying. If germs had lungs, if, if germs were things you could hear dying, that would be satisfying, yeah? That's why Carlos hates condoms. They, they mute all that good noise, all that living. This is a place to surrender, to let the skin feel accompanied. Who wouldn't want to feel together with someone else, yeah? And that's an excerpt from Bathhouse. Um, the next uh, play we'll be reading from is called Yermo. Um, it is a uh, it, is, it is part of a commission um, uh, through Texas Performing Arts and Fuse Box, uh, where uh, Rudy Ramirez led a, tree, a, a team of three other playwrights: uh, Crista Gonzalez, Victor Casares, and myself. Um, on this project, to like to we called it like. Ruining Lorca. Um, we all we all deeply love Lorca, yes. And also we were like, oh, like, yeah. What is the most bootleg version of Lorca that we could possibly come up with? Um, I think we're all interested in piracies uh, in different ways, um, being bootleg people ourselves. Um, so uh, this is from a play called Yermo, uh, which is a riff on Lorca's Yerma, um, which is... Uh, a play about desire um, and it takes as its sort of point of departure like um, yeah Im imagining a world where people get to be like fat in pleasurable ways where people get to be like fat and not punished for being fat where, where like where being fat can be like a, a way of experiencing pleasure um, in a way that, that can undo a world that would have us that it would have our bodies be otherwise um, so Yermo who is the title character deeply wants to get bigger uh, they want to they want to become the son, um, and Irma, who is Yermo's mother, is somebody who is also fat, and I think, um, yeah, is 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 in conflict with that particular um, configuration of of her body, and so um, this is a it, it, the scene is called bootleg flashback. Um, 
Guillermo looks at the honey bun on the ground. They pick up a honey bun package. They open it. They smell it. My mom always says, que era gordo de, last gordo de lastima. Irma rolls a metal cart carta blanca table on stage. On the table, there are four half-eaten pa uh, party plates with varying portions of asado de bodas, arroz en tomate, spaghetti. This is a bootleg flashback. It happens now and then, and somewhere between then and now, it's time travel to Tianguis. When I was eight, we had this big-ass party. We always had big-ass parties. But I remember this one because my mom had made asado de bodas. Porque en un chile rojo, dulce y picoso. I loved it so, so much. But we only ever had it at weddings. That's the name, Asado de Bodas. But I remember asking her for it. Ama, ¿puedo hacer el Asado de Bodas? Claro que sí, mijo. If that's what you want for your special day, that's what I'll make. You were my gift, so this will be your gift. She stayed up all night making enough for everyone who would come to the party. Tambos de arroz y de sopa. She made the asado outside in the same metal tub she bathed me in as a kid. I don't know if its purpose was for bathing children or letting pork stew. And the real answer is both things. She threw the asado with a two by four in this metal tub she'd bathed me in and run her finger across the wood and stick the finger in her mouth until it was ready. Until it was perfect. No, hombre, yo creo estaba enojada yo. Este asado me salió bien picoso. Mira, pruébalo. Te quedó perfecto, mami. Este picoso pero sabroso. It burned. It was so hot and sweet. All the fat and meat dressed in crimson. I wanted to be that deep and thick. Es puro veneno. Oh, pero espero que les guste. She served everyone personally, herself last. I always felt sorry for her, for serving herself last. Amá, ya, coma. No, estoy bien, mijo. Estoy pellizcando poquito a poquito de aquí a aquí. And during the party, I would watch people eat my gift. My gift my mother gave me, and I would get so excited when they would say, Ay, no, Yerma, qué rico. Le salió todo, la verdad. Tiene muy buena mano usted. Towards the end of the night, I looked over at my madrina's table, and there were plates with the food half finished. I didn't understand why anyone would do that. Ama, how come they didn't finish the food? How come they didn't make a happy plate? Pues ya ves cómo es mi comadre Chayo. Así es la familia. Ellos comen como pajaritos. Birds must be wasteful, stupid things, then, I thought. To leave behind asado de bodas and arroz and espagueti on a plate? I hated them for it. I hated Chayo and her stupid family and their idiot bird beaks. And then I watch my mom clear the table. Irma picks up a plate of leftovers and eats a spoonful of asado, then a spoonful of arroz, then a spork of spaghetti, as she clears the plate off stage. Válgame Dios, mira. Ay, no, por eso estoy como estoy. Soy gorda de lástima. Qué lástima desperdiciar la comida. Mejor me la como. ¿Cómo, cómo? Con la boca, mijo. Con la boca. Te quiero con la boca. Y yo quería comer. I took the plates left on child's table and I scooped up all the food onto one plate. I made a new full plate from the things they'd left. Pajaros miseros. And I ate my gifts. I ate my tributes like a little god of bellies. Not because I pitied the food going to waste, but because I wanted to. Because I could. No de lastima, pero de lujo ría. All that orange and red in my mouth like fire. A ring of grease and burning around my mouth and all that pleasure. I could have been the sun. Guillermo! No seas cochino. Oh, my God. Put the spoon down. No, I want it. This is my food. These are my gifts. And that's when he started getting big. That's when I started becoming myself. That's when I worried we still had to cut the cake. That's when I deserved cake the most is when I wanted it. That's when I stopped baking you cakes. It was too dangerous. You got my sweet tooth. I got your hunger. All I wanted was you. All I wanted was a baby, little, a little thing I could hold. When you could have wanted everything and said, Amma. Y lo que más siento es no tener la flor, pulpa o arcilla para el gusano de mi sufrimiento. What did you just say? Guillermo, you're going to end up like me, gorda de lástima. She was the feminine to refer to me sometimes. She'd slip and apologize for it. I loved her most then. When she made me her daughter. When she made me her mirror. Gorda y qué? I don't want to do this flashback anymore. I'm supposed to be at Chayo's funeral. I want to grieve my comadre. You could want more, ama. I miss my comadre, Guillermo. You deserved a better friend. You deserved somebody who wanted to be full. Good riddance to bad rubbish. That's enough. Seriously, who talks like that? Irma wheels away the Carta Blanca party table. Yermo sits at the bench with the honey bun. The phone rings. It's Jasmine. Yermo answers. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, the next excerpt is from a play called The River Its Mouths. Um, 
we're sort of uh, landing at the the border part of of borders and baths uh, and bathhouses. Um, this is a play that I wrote. Uh, this is the very first play that I wrote with multiple characters. Um, I wrote it um, at a time where we did not know if theater was going to be a possibility uh, uh, as a as like a, a place where people are in the same room with one another. Um, we were talking and thinking a lot about voice and um and i think preparing ourselves for like what might look like uh yeah like w what might theater look like digitally um what might the move towards an audio play as a way to keep people safe look like um the covid lockdown happened on the heels of several um moments that felt really damaging for for el paso and for 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 the border as an imagined place um, the appearance of um, Oscar Martinez and Valeria, his daughter, um, uh, their bodies floating on, on the Rio Grande, um, and the photograph that was then circulated to sort of show like, oh, this is, this is the sort of spectacular cruelty of the border. Um, a month after that, uh, the, um, the shooting that happened at the Walmart in El Paso, um, which was narrated by the shooter as, as an attempt to sort of clean up his country. Uh, to fight the specific sort of contagion of of the Mexican um, at the border. Um, I wrote this play called The River Its Mouths, um, which is about um, the summer of 2019. And, um, and it's framed around uh, a character named Yu, um, Y-O-U, um, who returns home after after having left home um, as rumors of a, of a Rio Grande mermaid start uh, sort of like buzzing in this particular town. And this mermaid or this creature um, is then attached to a series of deaths uh, of, of border patrol agents that, that happen um, in this border town um, where these border patrol agents are found uh, desiccated. Uh, so like all of the water in their body has sort of been drained away uh, by this creature. Um, this is a scene that happens towards the end of the play uh, where you has become obsessed with this mermaid story um, as a way to think about like what possibilities are there for, for justice at the border. Um, and they're talking to Mark, who is their um, sort of paramour. So um, I'll be reading for Mark, who is the like um, hometown like um, hookup. And then uh, Ricardo will be reading for you. A uh, last night, there you are in your hotel, Mark next to you. Above you, soothing your aching chest and throat, your siren, as if you just washed ashore. Psst. Psst. Hey. Hey, are you okay? You good? Shit. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I stopped. Uh, you, you, you got sleep apnea? No. I just had this in my dream. Everyone is sinking. Like it was like uh, I. It's okay. It's okay. Here. That M thing out there. It's. It's in me. Yeah, I hear that. You don't. You know what I mean. It, it's getting to you. Like all of this. Like being here. I, I. I get it. Have you. Uh. Have you decided if you're gonna stick around? I don't. know. I think. I wish I knew what I. Wanted. Come. Mark pulls you close. Kiss. He tries to kiss you. You pull away. Uh, okay. Are you... Uh, you're not feeling it tonight? No, I'm just... I'm feeling sick, I think, or... Oh. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I, I get that. It, it, I've been in the same space, too. Like, my pops fell yesterday, and, and I've been stressing between work and him and all the deaths. And It's all I can think about, Mark. Every day, all those people, their kids out there, their little arms wrapped around their parents, their necks, all those people... I know some make it, but so many haven't. Yeah. It's all I can. My cousin, he, um, my cousin, I mean, we weren't that close. Um, but you know how it is. Um, my cousin, he's, uh, well, he was down there, and I guess, um, I guess he was helping. The, they found his body. Oh, God. I'm so sorry. I didn't, I'm really, really sorry, Mark. If you, if you need anything. I love you. Yeah, I, I love you too. Thank you. I, I really needed someone to. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, it's also fucking weird and stupid. God, it feels like damn. I um, uh, when they found his body, like it, it, it wasn't in the river. It, it was just beside it, like, like he was trash, in the sand. It was like, like he'd been out there for days. His body was dried out, all of it, like, like the sun had eaten everything, stolen all of him from his body. They couldn't even pick him up properly. He he fell apart. Everything in him fell fell, fell apart. Is he? Was he border patrol? Yeah, yeah. He he'd been working a rescue, and I I guess I. Good. What? Good. Good. He died the way he did, alone, like fucking trash. Fuck you. Those people drowning. They're drowning because of animals like him, like your cousin. I'm glad he's dead. Good. Glad. This world it don't, doesn't need him. I hope it hurt. I hope it was excruciating. Every minute he spent dying. And if you had any capacity to actually use your fucking Nobody fucking head, deserves to die out there. Nobody. You have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. You need to stop. No. You don't get to be sad about innocent people drowning and also cry about your fucking shit. You don't get to tell people how to fucking feel. You don't get to tell people how to feel about anything. What the fuck? What right do you have to anything? To anything here? God, my cousin? You fucking bitch. You, you've you been back for three days. Less than three days. And you... Fuck. What the fuck is wrong with you tonight? I wish you would just go. You wish I would go? Would that make it easier for you and whoever else you're fucking right now? Hmm. Diana told me. She said you were seeing someone, which you never mentioned. Not that whole fucking time since I've been here. You never once. For what? For what? Who owes you shit? Who owes you anything? You don't live here. We fuck when you visit and then you leave again. You come in here. You get to just pick all the shit you like and take it with you. And what? <sighs> And what is it there to take from here, Mark? What do I take back with me? You? You with a whole other person who you lie to at night so you can sleep here next to me like a dog, waiting for the next time I come around to feed you. You sitting here, rotting, doing what, Mark? Doing what all of you fucking do in this shithole? Nothing. Waiting and watching everyone and everyone around you die. And all you just shrug and rot to because you don't know how to do anything else. But rot right here. Do you know why I come home when I feel bad? I come home to pity you. You need to shut your stupid fucking mouth before I... Do it. Do something. Do anything, Mark. Do anything. Get me closer. I feel fucking sorry for you. You... You have nothing here. You left and came back nothing. Mark kisses you. He bites down hard and draws blood in opening. Go! Get out! Get the fuck out! Get the fuck out now! Go! You should too. You should get out too before... Mark's mouth turns to nighttime. Mark leaves. You can barely stay upright. You might grow a tail. Fins. Cool. Uh... And then the last, uh, the last play we'll read from is uh, a show that I'm working on now. Um, I wrote the first draft uh, at, uh, last fall. Um, the sort of like last page was finished in December. Um, it's called Play Made. Um, my mom has been cleaning houses in the U.S. Uh, since she was 13. Um, she is 65 now. Uh, she will turn 66 in September. She continues to clean houses. Um, my mom's labor is the reason I started writing. Um, I wanted to figure out where to put all of the like terrible feelings I was having about the fact that she, that her body was being changed by this labor she was doing by, by, by her cleaning these houses. Um, I've also been thinking a lot about Lupin Tiberos, who, uh, uh, is an actor and who, who died with the sort of legacy of having played a maid over 150 times in her lifetime. Um, you will, you might know her as the woman who killed Selena in the movie Selena. That is Lupin Tiberos. Uh, but she, uh, yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about what it means to play maid, um, not just as an actor, but also um, to enter that particular social position and, and move in the service of other people's well-being um, while expending your own. Um, Playmade is, uh, there are three different kinds of monologues. Um, one is, which you'll hear uh, from Ricardo, uh, is myself um, imagining interactions that I would have with her employers 
um, after she's passed away. So like th this very much feels like a preemptive grieving ritual. Um, so it's, it's me sort of imagining what I might say to the people that my mom worked for after she's passed. Uh, the second set of monologues is really all about actresses who've played, uh, who've played maid before. Uh, and then the, th the sort of third, uh, iteration, which, which I'll end with is, um, the archetype of the maid speaking. So, um, so Ricardo will do, uh, a monologue called, uh, preemptive grieving number three house visit at Carmelita's house. Hi, Carmelita. Oh, God, I didn't mean to scare you. No, 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 I'm coming in to just return your keys, her copies. Sorry. I hope you forgive me for barging in like this. I knocked, but I didn't know if you were here. I mean, I saw your car, but I know, I, I know you don't drive that often anymore, so I wasn't sure. I don't, I don't want to be a bother. I wanted to come by and see how you were doing now that she's gone. How are you? How are you doing? Do you need help around the house? Oh, of course, of course. I wanted to come and offer that. Yeah, I'd be happy. I'd be more than happy to help if that feels okay for you. Today, just today, with whatever you might need. I don't know if you have anyone new. No, 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 no. P please have a seat. Can I get you something? Coffee? I know it's early. She would tell me you would have coffee together during the last few years she worked here when you stopped going into the office as much. Maybe we can do that now, you and I. I would like that. Please, stay seated. No, 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 I know where everything is. Or have you changed anything since? No, right. She would, don't worry, I don't know it as well as she did, but I remember enough. When I was in high school and middle school on Saturdays, I'd come and clean the big windows and the glass doors by the pools. She hated getting up on the stepladder. She made it, she said it made her feel too cramped, like a little meatball. So I would just do all the high up stuff and the big windows. Yep. Everything is where everything is. You take yours black, two sweet and lows, a package of Lorna Dunes. She puts so much cream in hers, but only one sweet and low because she thought she was being healthy. And look where that got her. I drink mine black, just as it is. I like to know it's just coffee. This is strange, but I wanted to come by because I miss her. And I can't imagine anyone who might have seen her as often as you, who might also miss her as much as I do. I mean, my dad, but woof, that guy. He is, he's not good with grief. My God, I just think, I think you might know her better parts of her. I really do. I really, really do. Can I ask you a few questions about her, about you and her? Did you ever think she was pretty? I don't think she ever did. I can't remember a single time she ever said anything nice about herself, but she always wore makeup to come here. Always. I always wondered why you'd wear makeup to stand over someone's toilet. But I guess, why wouldn't you? What colors do you think looked good on her? What's the craziest thing she ever said to you? She was a lot sometimes. I know she was a lot sometimes because by the end, she got into fights with almost everyone in the family. And it was honestly the funniest thing. She was always so damn funny when she was just being honest. But she was always so rude. So I also want to know if she made you laugh. This was the house she worked at the longest, so you were the person she knew most. I heard so much about you. I know we've met a few times, obviously, but really, she would share so much about you to me late at night while she drank coffee, about your worries, about your sons, about the twins, about Mauricio. She said you worried about Mauricio, that he'd be lonely and mean, that he turned out to be like you. I know. I know it's not any of my business, but she did. I did think she, because she worried about you. I loved her so much on those nights when she'd tell me about you because I think then she'd make the coolest thing to another woman in the house with her, and I loved the best. She'd make the closest thing to another woman in the house with her, and I loved that best when she'd make me her daughter. I wanted to thank you for that too, for making me her daughter. It's the only time I make sense. And now I set the table and it's too quiet and there's no coffee. Y yo me siento como un pinche garabato en esa casa. I just wanted to know if you could let me know anything you might know about her. You and her and I. Play maid. I'm almost myself here. I am playing the maid now. We're playing maid. You paid your ticket, so we're going to play maid. We're going to play maid. So you've got the money, and I've got the kids, and we both got the keys to the house, but I know it better. But you own the butter. So you know now when I've had it on my toast when you're gone. So we're going to play maid, you and I. Yeah, you and I, we're going to play maid. How would you like me? 
How would you like it? How do you want me to do it? Here's the thing is I know this house really well. And if we all wanted to, if we really wanted to, we'd bring the house down. We know where you keep the good stuff. I know where you keep your best things. And if we wanted to, if we wanted to, if we really wanted to, it would mean we would have to choose not to feed ourselves, our children. It would mean we wouldn't be able to order Avon anymore. Some days I wish I wanted you dead more than I want myself alive because then I'd do it. Then I'd show you how well I know this house. So we're going to play maid, you and I, until one of us gets tired. And surprise, it'll be you first. You'll get tired of me aging. My three teeth gone, the surgery on my eye, the four times I canceled in the last month. You're going to get tired first that I'm alive. It's not that easy, I know, you and I. It's not easy. You'll love me, you'll think. I'll love you, I'll think. I'll think of Christ's love, but I'll never go to church too tired. And the meek shall inherit the earth, the dirt, my allowance, your old clothes, the three Jimmy Dean sausage sandwiches you let me steal last week, frozen. And that's love, you'll think. An extra hundred dollars, and I'll think that's love too. And it is, isn't it? The extent to which I love you and how far you imagine you let me steal and how much I know of this house and all the things I won't do to it and how lonely I know you are. Your kid's gone. And how backwards we did it, you and I. We're going to play maid, you and I. So it means some days we might as well play married, you and I. The kids we raised together, yours now gone. Mine, I didn't, as kids, raise them. So they come around now, and I know them now as people I'm trying to get to know as kids. And both of us, you and I, lonely. That's how we'll play, you and I. That's how we'll play house. That's how we'll play maid, you and I. That's how I'll play maid. It never ends, does it? This house, always a you with the keys, always an I with the copies. It never ends, this house, but I know it best. And we have done this for hundreds of years, you's and I's, hundreds of keys, kids, commodes, hundreds of kneecaps and elbows, hundreds, and I think I'm close now. I'm bluffing, but we got to pretty pretend. We, we, we got to play and we got to practice. So we're going to play. We're going to play maid. We're going to practice the end of the maid play. You and I, the, the one where, where they practice killing the lady, the one where the maid's son dies. We're going to practice the maid play where everything ends and we just keep going. The world is always at sixes and sevens. Mr. Antrobus, that one? <laughs> We're going to practice the end where I want the fucking house for just a few seconds before they kill me when they find you dead. We're going to practice, you and I. We're going to play made long enough that I can practice wanting you dead more than I want me alive. And maybe if we both die in here, nobody will want to think about this place as a house anymore. Just dirt. And it finally won't be my job. I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, and I'll kick my feet up. Stage directions. On the wall, there is that picture of my mother and I, both of us in red. She's facing the camera. I'm walking away from her. The stage manager brings me a cleaning cart. They let the audience out of the house. They tell them to go home. Everybody goes home. Everybody goes home. I clean the programs they left behind, their water bottles. I keep their lost items. I get left the fuck alone. I clean until everything is ready for tomorrow's show. End of play. the little knob, yeah. All right, we went a little bit 
longer because I wanted to get all of that out of <laughs> Jesus. Um, I want to say again that this Yale Drama Award is a very, very big deal. It's been, what, 15 years now? And we were figured, I think there have been four Latine um, writers to get it, um, although there now are two queer brown Texans because Vicky Grice also was the first woman of color um, to receive it over 10 years ago, mm -hmm. I think. Um, just so I wanted to say yay to that again. And you're going to Tuscany as part of this? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk. The press release said I would be in Tuscany. And I, um, this is a little uh, Jeremy O'Hara's tea. Um, so they announced the price March 6th. And they were like, the residency uh, in Tuscany starts March 15th. And I was like, I have a thesis. I have <laughs> this event. Yes. I have a show at Texas State. I have the San Antonio Book Festival. Uh, so I was like, I'm, I, I'll, I'll, oh. I will pass on this. Uh. But it's funny because the like all of the articles are like, Vias will attend a residency. And yes. I was like, I'll, I'll go to Olive Garden. <laughs> <laughs> so before we break to lunch, um, are there any questions from the audience or any comments? Are you just drinking it in still? Or having sucked out of you by the siren? <laughs> <laughs> I um I want to ask a little bit about yeah. that play then. Yeah. yeah. So um if that was you wrote it during quarantine. Yeah, yeah, during during lockdown from my kitchen in Austin, Texas. Um I got into graduate school March eighth of twenty twenty. Oh wow. Uh, on March twelfth, uh we we were gonna start spring break. Uh, at, at my, the high school I was teaching at uh, on March 13th, the district sent us an email that was like, hey, spring break is going to be two weeks, y'all. Um, and then it was in two weeks. And I took like a month and a half to to say yes to to the program because mm. I, yeah, like who who wants to make a decision mm. when, when we don't know anything? Uh, so, um, yeah, I started writing it because I wanted to write multiple characters uh, I, I my background is largely in solo performance um on documents is the first play that i ever really wrote and and continue to perform um and i wanted to challenge myself to write for other people um so yeah i, I wrote it from my kitchen in austin texas very much thinking like oh we'll never be doing theater again mm. this will be fun for zoom this will be fun <laughs> for podcasts Oh, and just to plug, it has a show this Saturday at mm -hmm. the Annenberg Live Arts. What's the theater called? Live Arts, Montgomery. The Montgomery Theater. Um, and that's another solo performance. Mm -hmm. It's a reading. Yeah. Um, that is called... Bala Fruta, Bullet uh, Fruit. Um, but yeah, I just um, also then to sort of talk about... So that was the sort of, you know, that was the emotional texture of yeah. the writing. But um, sort of across the plays, they're all distinct structurally. Mm-hmm. Um, is that like an intent you go in with or how do they form? Uh, I think I never got tired of, of getting like a pleasure to have in class on report cards. Mm -hmm. And so every, <laughs> yeah, I'm a try hard and, uh, but I act like I'm not, but I fully am. You're um, a pleaser. <laughs> yeah. Every semester, um, all of the plays I think really get their structure from Julia Draco, who's the head of playwriting. Um, sort of saying, like, this is the assignment for the semester. Uh -huh. And I think I am literal about it. So um, A River Its Mouths, the, the theme for the semester was voice. Um, if you look at the play on the page and you read the whole play, um, all of the scenes begin with the character's speech devolving into the sounds of nighttime or the sounds of the river. So I, I was really obsessed with, like, how irrelevant language felt at the time um uh that the, the language is is just like the the best way we can cope with the fact that we're mostly just water and skin um and and so yeah the play is like that bathhouse.powerpoint literally is because julia jarko was like we're writing plays about landscapes and i was like okay bathhouses are a landscape <laughs> um and then in the syllabus she notes your final for this your final for this semester will be a 20 minute powerpoint play presentation <laughs> parentheses um this combination of words is so horrifying that it pleases me um and i was like okay like if you want a powerpoint as a final i'm just going to give you a powerpoint the whole semester 
So meta, I, meta. <laughs> so, so I wrote the play. I actually wrote the play. It's very dumb dramaturgy. I would just like Google images for like baths, cleanliness, bathhouses, <laughs> and use like whatever image was most striking to me. I would sort of like take, put it on the page, and then it would become the scene. Uh, that's a great like use that when you teach <laughs> for your students. Yeah. A great exercise. And then I want to talk about the play made because oh, yeah. it struck me that um, every sort of person cleaning, person house getting cleaned is always a kind of monologic situation. Yeah. So it's the it's the command to clean and it's the entreaty to serve, right? Yeah. Um, but then how did sort of the layer of representation get into it? Like, like I loved Lupe as a person. She was a great time. Yeah. And she loved the queen, so. Uh, <laughs> you could tell, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I never got to meet her, but, like, uh, for, be, for this play, I went back and watched so many of her YouTube videos, her interviews. She has an amazing interview with Terry Gross uh, on Fresh Air. Um, she has this incredible, um, there's this incredible, like, 15-minute long interview. She's from El Paso as well. She's born in El Paso, so I just immediately, like, she's, like, in my bones. Um uh, the theater that I did on documents at in LA in October, November was, was the Lupe Antiveros theater. I did yes. it in the Lupe Antiveros. Where she last performed La Victima. Yeah. So I just, I, f- you know, to go back to like the, the word representation, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's been strange when Devious Maids happened, mm. uh, a show which, which Mark Cherry, who did Desperate Housewives, brought Tania Saracho on to like help make and write. A lot of people were like, we're tired of being made. We're tired of being seen as made. As did every actress who was on it. <laughs> yeah. And I, <sighs> boo. That felt really strange to hear. Like I'm exhausted of being this thing. And I get the why. Um, but it, it, it does feel strange to sit with, this particular job and occupation as like a receptacle for uh, uh, like very specific iterations of, of racialized and xenophobic disdain. Yes. Um, and, and that the, the maid also gets to be like a piñata that like Latine performers and creators yes. get to take like a, a hit at um, as, as the thing they don't want to be. And uh, at Castle Long Beach, uh, my my work was was uh, in ethnographic research methods. I I was the people I was working with were Latina domestic workers. This was at the time when when Chirla and uh, the National Network for Domestic Workers was, were were really pushing towards a domestic bill of rights, and so it was wild to be like in this community of people who were like insisting on their labor. And then also hear this other discourse that was like, we're tired of seeing ourselves as maids. And I was like, maids exist, friends. Like yes. domestic work is like is is labor and and so I, I have a lot of like yes. now, I maintain two bands as a theater audience member. I don't see um hip hop plays by white people and I don't go to maid plays where we don't enter that woman's house. Mm. Um, so I've never and never will see Carolina change um for that reason. But you know, a raisin in the sun is you know, is our foundation in some ways. Um, so no qu- yes. Thank you so much. It's, uh, I'm a fan of both of you. Thank you. So thank you so much for bringing my work. It's wonderful. Um, uh, I also live in Texas. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. This sort of picks up on the sort of comment that you made a moment ago about meta mm-hmm. and sort of what you were talking about just now about labor. And mm-hmm. in the the piece that you ended in HD. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last text that you read, I wasn't sure. So this is like a, a question, but sort of a larger yeah. question that's wrapped inside of it. So I wasn't sure if that was spoken text or if that was stage directions, but I heard it as spoken text in like the style of stage directions. Mm-hmm. And it made me think about theatrical labor um, because, you know, your character in that moment, um, even if it was just acting, stage directions and not spoken text stage directions it, you know you were also like, like cleaning up after the show and so I would love to hear you talk about sort of how theater shows up in your work because I noticed that sort of as a thread throughout a lot of the pieces there was like an awareness that we were also doing theater or like where we were was also being marked in the play like even in the bathhouse piece like you know like the conceit of the I'm, I'm saying things that you, uh, you know, 
yeah, yeah. It's like where my brain is at, you know, like where we are, like we're in this school or whatever, or like the style of like a presentation. So aware throughout, like that we're making theater, which is like not the leadership. Yeah. Thing. And so hear, I'd love to hear you talk about that sort of dramaturgy in your work, the sort of like non, I don't know how you would describe it, but that's what I'm observing. And maybe if you, if in your mind, I'm curious if that connects to these larger conversations that your work is having about racialized and gendered labor. I'm thinking of the comment you made at the very beginning too, about how as an artist, it's hard to not feel like an object when you're being presented, but here you felt like there was care and love. And so that also like made me think about sort of like you as an artist and as a person, but who's also a laborly body yeah. um, inside of a system that might want to be extracted. So it's, it's a question about theater and sort of how that shows up in your theater. Does yeah, that make sense? no, totally. Yeah. Um, uh, oy. um, one, I, I, I have a really, I had a really difficult time identifying inside of any artistic tradition. Like, like I, it took me a very long time to be like, oh, I, I'm, I'm a playwright. And, um, because I, I think I have a lot of deep love for people who, who are like formally trained like i actually because i because i think that that requires a tremendous amount of disciplining um of the body and like and building up like a, a a relationship to like tradition and history and form and 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 style um and i literally am just somebody who was like really depressed and then started doing theater so that i wouldn't binge drink as much which is a weird plan um uh at like 27 28 you know um and so a lot of a lot of my experience, my a lot of my interfacing with with theater is like f like being deeply in love. Like it's my favorite form. Um, like 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 the yeah, just like watching a play is my favorite thing to do. Like my actual factual like favorite thing to do. Um, I also started doing theater when I was a high school teacher, and I think having to be like okay, so I'm getting to my classroom at seven thirty, eight o'clock. You know, depending on the day, class starts at nine um 4 30 the bell rings i have to be at rehearsal by 6 30 so like when is tutoring gonna happen what do i want my office hours to look like what 7 11 am i gonna grab a slice of pizza and then get on the bus so they can get to rehearsal so that i can and so like i'm immediately constantly doing like like the calculus of of work of labor um like i love teaching it's 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 the it's the best thing i'll ever do and also I was like, yeah, like this is work. Like it, it is expending, like I, my heels hurt. Um, uh, so I started doing theater and I started realizing and, and like noticing like, okay, like Austin was a cool place to do theater because the city is so just like tight with their funding um, that everyone kind of just does whatever they want because they're like, well, we're underfunded, so fuck it. I guess. Oh, <laughs> oh no, the investors are gonna be scared. Like, who cares? Like, no, everybody's broke. Um, so I, yeah, the, the the question of labor and compensation, I think for me was always like like a like really present, especially largely because I sweat so much when I when I perform. When I'm on stage, like it just like buckets, like I am drenched. Like, you and Whitney from <laughs> from from like from from go right, like I and and I think, um, yeah, like that sweating is that sweating is letting people know exertion is happening. Like at the level of the muscle, something is like I I, I am expending something, and and yes, thank you for coming to the show, and also like. Like you came to be entertained. You came to what if, for whatever reason you came. You came expecting something from me, and now I am sweating. So literally, like when people talk about leaving it on the floor, like I, I literally factually, like, I am on this on the floor. Um, I had a a director of a company who one time uh, a group of actors didn't feel safe opening the show when we were supposed to open the show. It was an outdoor show. The conditions were really wild. And uh, the director of the company said, um, well, if we postpone the show, you know, it just, uh, we want to, and this is what she said. And I was like, what the fuck? She said, we want to be able to pay you guys what you deserve. Ooh, now. <laughs> and, 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 and pushing opening might, might prevent us from doing that. 
And I, yeah, like before I'm an artist, I'm a person who needs to pay bills. Our <laughs> artists are people who need to pay bills. And so I was like, did you not have the budget for the actors? Did you, did you not? Because if you didn't have the budget, then you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have brought us in. And right? she just like turned deep red and was like, no, 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 I hope this is a misunderstanding. And I was like, this is not a misunderstanding. You just threatened us with our paycheck. Um, and I, I don't care that, you know, this is a deeply important whatever, whatever, like, give me my money. So I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think I constantly think about theater as the form I love most. And so it's just so, so that I think the love shows up in, in how I frame and imagine things. And also I try to be as mindful as I can as a playwright about how I am structuring how long someone is on stage or what they're having to do on stage. Um, because I also recognize having been an actor for, for a long time or, you know, for enough that like it's work, it, you're expending something. So thank you for the question. Well, thank you for all that sweating and let's have some food. Now I want Olive Garden. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Oh, okay. you want this one? Am I working? Yeah, okay, I'm are. working. I'm on now. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, there's food. I, I think Jessica will show you where it is, but in the back uh, room near the kitchen over there. And yeah, if you would like to continue talking to Jesus or Ricardo um, about their work um, and yeah, other things that are coming up for them, uh, yeah, please stick around. And as they mentioned before, we do have a staged reading of Jesus' play, Bala Fruta, Bullet Fruit from 7 to 9 p.m. on Saturday in Penn Live Arts Montgomery Theater, which is in the basement of Penn Live Arts. So yeah, hope to see you all there, but thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.